we, we can stick to the, the creation science as opposed to the, the, um, um, the standard or conventional science, conventional paradigm. Pretty much that's what it is. It's, it's two paradigms. You have the creation paradigm and then the conventional paradigm. So, like, I guess genetic entropy would be one of the the big topics, and I know you you said you were looking that up since the last time we had spoke about it. So, did you get a chance to like watch any lectures or anything from Dr. Sanford, John Sanford? Um, I read a a paper that he authored um, uh, yesterday and part of today. So there are there are parts from that paper we can discuss, but then I, I looked into okay. genetic entropy and I looked into some of the criticisms of it and all that. So yeah, I've, I, I took tons of notes on it, so I'm, I'm happy to go okay. over it. Um, uh, what I think we should start with is you frame genetic entropy. Cause if I'm biased, I'm the only person that doesn't know it. So I could straw man the ever living crap out of genetic entropy just <laughs> to make myself sound good. So sure. Yeah, so genetic oh, entropy. Really quick, before you say that, Adam, um, yeah. I'm not sure if you said this a minute ago, but um, just to go off what you just said earlier, Peterson, about our belief in evolution, where that comes from, or our disbelief. Uh, so we'll stick to the sciences, and we think that's good because both of us, uh, well, you and us, we presuppose that science is a way to reach truth. And so we'll, we'll start with our common body of presuppositions, but like with um, – we – do actually reason that because evolution is incompatible with Genesis, that is another reason to not believe evolution. Of course, like I said, you know, because you don't believe Genesis, it would be useless for us to go through Genesis to try to use that as evidence to convince you. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. Now I think there's the right uh, place for us to start from. Sure. You know. Okay. So, Genetic entropy, essentially, we go through a series of genetic mutations over time. Each generation is going to have more genetic uh, mutations than the previous generation. I have a certain amount, depending on my age, more than my parents, and then my parents have more than their parents, and so on and so forth. And so that's like the basic, easy understanding. It's just a series of mutation mutations that go down generation after generation. <clears throat> and this is all species have this same issue right so uh every here's how i understood it yeah every every generation has uh new mutations that the generation before them didn't have uh sanford also makes the claim that most mutations are harmful uh that, well there are a bunch of claims i have them in bullet points but that's one of them and also the frequency of of harmful mutations uh, steadily increases. That one, I looked into some of the mathematics, but mathematics is not my strong suit. So, uh, that one will probably just have to be left where it is. Um, but anyways, it, does that sound that that sounds like the theory as you understood it? Yeah. And the increases are like really minute. Um, they, the ones, cause genetic entropy as a, as a, basic concept this is not disputed amongst geneticists this is a pretty common accepted topic um what how it affects like evolution so to say um that's a different story but as far as the actual mutations being observed we've we've done tests on it if you did, did you read the paper from sanford um doing the mitochondrial eve yes. uh, y chromosome adam okay yeah Which i have one? a whole section on that but i i just i just want to go through the theory first um sure. in, in general so um i just have a whole list of things i'm not I, I, i'd like to go through them all but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna list all of them we can just do like one by one or whatever um yep. so one of the problems with genetic entropy is that to me the way I read into it is it assumes that natural selection doesn't play a role. I guess one thing I should say is I know that you guys, um, I, I know we weren't going to focus on like the Bible or whatever, but you believe that like the, the flood happened, there were animals on the ark, but there are one and a half million documented species. You don't think one and a half million pairs of animals around the ark. You think it was much fewer and they diversified after the flood. Yes, yes. sir. Do you so I'm I'm actually kind of confused. Do you think that natural selection is 
the the mechanism behind what caused them to speciate after the flood? Or do you think that natural yeah. selection isn't even... Natural selection is definitely involved in speciation okay. after the arc, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, cool. Um, I, I figured, but I, that, was, that was important to start with, I think. Um, but I don't think... So genetic entropy seems like it doesn't take into account natural selection as a role. Because in reality... Um, individuals with harmful mutations don't pass down their genes nearly as often as individuals who don't have them. Uh, the in fact, the vast majority of all organisms never reproduce. So it, I feel like you'd have to believe that every single offspring always inherits harmful mutations and reject that some organisms are more fit to their environment or that every member, or, or alternatively, you'd have to believe yeah, there's a there's a, there's a bell curve of fitness, but every member contributes to reproduction. So ultimately, like it doesn't. Let's say we're we're at that point of of getting off the ark, and we now have X amount of what the biblical word would be kind, which is very close to uh, family mm -hmm. on the taxonomic scale. So um, the natural selection, it, like it sounded like what you were saying was. It's kind of like they're at odds with each other because you're not going to have natural selection take place while these animals are also mutating. The, the, the genes are mutating because natural selection is going to allow the ones with better genes to survive. And then genetic entropy would say that all of them are going through the same problem and all of them are having issues with their yeah, genetic code. In order for genetic entropy to be the observed phenomenon that is happening, you have to assume that the the harmful mutations in perpetuity continue to be passed down and inherited and that's just that's incompatible with natural selection well i i it was, it's more like for example if a dog let's let's look at a, a medium haired dog 75 pound dog lives in uh northern canada has to go up north to find food for whatever reason and then it's, it's two of these dogs, I'm sorry. And so they breed and then they have six puppies <laughs> and two of them are long haired. Two of them are medium haired. Two of them are short haired. The, the short haired and the medium hair are eventually going to die off if they have to live in an Arctic climate along with the parents because they'll need the long hair to keep their bodies warm and to regulate the temperature, eventually turn white, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> that would go along with genetic entropy because the mutations may not that won't necessarily have to do with survivability at this point other than those specific genes so they may all have the same amount of mutations but just different t kinds of mutations so like all of those siblings won't have the exact same mutations will have similar maybe because they have the same parents but the ones that had the mutations that happened to give them long hair that's natural selection killing off the other ones and them surviving so I don't think that would be inconsistent with the biblical timeline. Well, I think well, what no, 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 not Peter's the biblical timeline. Man, I'm talking about genetic entropy. You're you're doubting whether uh, any mutations that accrue in the gene code would actually all be passed down, because not all that many organisms actually even get to reproduce. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, tons of okay. alleles never never make it because of that. <clears throat> okay, well, I mean. That wouldn't mean that genetic entropy isn't passed down. It would just mean that it would be slowed. And so if we're still measuring it nowadays, that would still be something. You know, it wouldn't say that it would have to necessarily stop because few organisms reproduce. Um, yeah, I, but I just don't think that's an accurate reading of, of Sanford. Is it, it's Sanford, right? Not Stanford. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that's an accurate reading of Sanford's claims because he claims that the, the majority of... Well, he claims that the there, there's actually several things. The majority of, of mutations are harmful, and mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd like to unpack that later on, much much later on. Um, but also, he says that harmful mutations continue to accumulate. So if you would graph it, um, if we would graph this, the graph would look like beneficial or neutral mutations here, harmful mutations here. The graph would look like that. They diverge, and harmful mutations rise. But... I, that just because of natural selection that won't happen. So I just don't think that genetic entropy. Again, I'm not arguing like against a biblical timeline or anything here. I'm just arguing that yeah. um, genetic yeah. entropy 
doesn't make sense in the light of of natural selection. And I, I don't think it makes sense in the light of experimental evidence either. Um, I mean, I, are there not mutations that build up in the gene code, but don't necessarily manifest in some phenotype? So it doesn't have any say necessarily in natural selection yet. Natural selection only comes into play when you have some kind of phenotype, you know, which is a, well, you know, you're a science teacher, you know, a <laughs> manifestation of some trait that actually kind of helps something survive. And so if it hasn't manifested, but you just have these mutations in the gene code, then it wouldn't prevent it from being passed down. Natural selection, it would be yeah. invisible to natural selection. Yeah, but genetic entropy, again, it, one of the core parts of the of the idea is that most mutations are harmful. So like we're, we're all three disagreeing with that. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying that most mutations aren't har harmful. Um, not to use a double negative kind of sort of there, but um, I don't think that that would necessarily go against natural selection because if if said siblings or said group of animals, not all of them are going to get the same mutations, and it just so happens that you know this group got the one that made it work so they could live in the cave or so they could live in the snow or so they could live wherever yeah. and it, they'll be okay. Whereas the other ones, which had other forms of mutations that did not help them, which was that, that would still follow under uh, natural selection. Yeah. But I, I just, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself over and over again. Yes, that does follow natural selection, but not genetic entropy, which uh, assumes that most mutations are harmful. Um, there's a really cool experiment where they, they tested for something kind of like this. Um, it's by Sarah Joseph and David Wall. Um, mm. it's called the, it's called a forced inbreeding experiment and they, they used yeast. So the don't call, who's, who's the, who's the <laughs> animal inhumane of, people. Of, who's the animal version of HR? I'm not sure who that is. Eda. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like in in term with like uh, regards to scientific research, because um, there are actually ethical guidelines for using animals or whatever. But oh. what they do is they graph um, yeah. they graph the fitness of a group of organisms yeast, and what you find is a really tight bell curve over one. So one just means like uh, it, it matches like their normal, because fitness is measured by your ability to reproduce. That's really what fitness is. So some individuals are a little bit better than the average individual. Uh, in other words, they propagate quicker. Others are slightly worse. So these, these experiments are really cool. What they do is they force the, the yeast to inbreed, which what that does is it removes natural selection. So we know that inbreeding causes harmful alleles to accumulate in your gene pool, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So by doing the, the forced inbreeding or whatever, it removes natural selection as a corrective mechanism. And what you find is that that bell curve, instead of being really tight, uh, we call that stabilizing selection. I don't know if you've heard that term before, but instead it, it flattens out and at the extreme ends, it extends greatly. So now you get some yeast who their fitness is way, way, way negative, where, where that didn't exist in the, in the original population. Um, so what that, what that tells us, what the forced inbreeding tells us, or when you compare that to the <clears throat> to the genome, genomic composition, whatever, of the, or no, we're not actually looking at the genomes, we're just looking at fitness. When you compare that before you do the inbreeding, um, the data clearly shows that natural selection cures a population of harmful mutations. Because when you remove natural selection, you see a, a great you see a lot more organisms with very low fitness. Um, now, what's really weird is inbreeding actually produces more beneficial mutations than natural selection does. Um, but so that proves that mutations can be beneficial. But you also get quite, I argue, it's probably offset by the great number of harmful mutations. Okay. So I. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I think I'm looking at the same thing you're talking about. Is that the University of Chicago? Oh, I didn't write down what university it was, but... That's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, sorry. But so these, I guess one of the questions I would have is what would the, I don't know if this is a valid question or not, but in looking at the yeast, like what was the amount of genetic mutations that it had as opposed to like, like how do you measure 
is this a healthier yeast with less genetic mutations or, or is this one with, with I guess by the rate at which they reproduce. So it actually isn't I I'm I don't think they even sequenced their genomes. Maybe they did, but we actually don't need to. It was just a study in uh fitness. So they just looked at their their reproductive rate essentially. So before the inbreeding, it was it was really tight because natural selection again was was weeding out those that had uh an unfavorable traits that led to unfavor they were out competed by their fellow members that had better reproductive rates right and then when they force the inbreeding and remove natural selection uh then that allows all these harmful mutations to well i'm saying mutations we're we're assuming that mutations are occurring but that's the only way that organisms vary from one another within a population um yeah, they're they're just graphing fitness, which is measured by the rate at which they reproduce. Okay, so I guess would you? So is your issue more so since these two kind of seem to have an issue? Like, do you do you think that genetic entropy is a legitimate like issue that we face, mm -mm. or do you think okay? So you don't think that we're not we're getting a x amount of mutations over a series of generations. I so I agree that mutations happen, but I think the specific implications or the, the specific claims of genetic entropy, I think, are bunk, because, again, it's it's centered around the idea that um, several things. But one, the only one I'm focusing on right now is Sanford claims that most mutations are harmful. So I wouldn't. Okay. So, well, hold on. So you're yeah. saying then that natural selection is such a powerful mechanism that it's able to remove all the harmful mutations no not all but um and we can get into this because there are um what are they called fancy word i forgot what it was um uh, uh what is it called i'm sorry compensatory mutations i'm sorry there are also compensatory hmm. mutations which well we'll get to that in a little bit but um, yeah, natural selection is powerful enough to remove the influence of harmful mutations from a population. So I think that forced inbreeding experiment backs that up. And it's very possible they did a terrible job explaining it. It's it's best explained by looking at at the data uh, rather than listening to me explain the data. But no, I think this is really interesting, and I, I appreciate that you brought that up. Um, I admit I should have maybe read. Dr. Sanford's uh, article before joining this debate, but um, I'll put it in the comments. Just, well, thank you. But it just seems to me, and I think you're making a good argument here, but it just seems to me kind of a stretch to say, because natural selection is able to remove some bad characteristics out of the gene code that um, bad characteristics as a whole, or like are not passed down enough to endanger an organism in the long run, you know, because that's one thing that I know Dr. Sanford gets to later on is he argues that uh, humanity should not have been able to live 100,000 years, you know, or the proper timeline from Homo erectus all the way to where we are today, uh, that we would have died over and over again because of these this uh, buildup of uh, mutations, harmful mutations in our gene code, you know? Um, so he's saying like, it's this big thing that actually limits an organism from being able to live for a certain amount of time. Like yeah. you would eventually not be able to function anymore. And you're saying natural selection is powerful enough to prevent that from happening. Um, which I do think is kind of interesting. Um, but then, then you would have to say that all bad characteristics, like, like it's effectively stopped, you know, they're either stopped or they just don't manifest that to say that an organism could continue reproducing ad infinitum and it would never come to a point where they'd have to stop at some point. You know, I just, it seems a big claim, but I don't have the exact data to say, oh, well, here's an in instance where natural selection wasn't able to do anything with this bad mutation and it still ended up causing the organism to die, to not survive. Sure. Um, Although I might be able to think of it if I think for a minute. You go ahead. Sure. Um, the the thing I don't know if you wrote down the or yeah you had it because of the Chicago paper or whatever. But I I encourage you to look at the the forced inbreeding one because to me that that clearly shows the um 
the, the influence of of natural selection because when the when you remove natural selection when you force them to breed the way you want them to breed instead of the way they naturally breed then you see decreases in fitness uh whereas if you leave them alone uh there's this there's this um biologist who has a really famous quote i can't remember what his name was but he says natural selection is more clever than you are right so it has these ways of uh um correcting for it but um it's not just natural selection because um like i said sanford he explicitly says that most mutations are harmful and i don't think that's true um and we can go over that later but even if it was true i i don't think that that's really that great of a point because we have non-random mating uh natural selection which we've already gone over uh sexual selection predation disease parasites and probably more things um that control for that that act basically as um a sieve for individuals that aren't well fit into their environment um and again the vast majority of organisms don't reproduce uh, only only a few do and only the ones that uh have the best fitness do so it continues driving the well it, it helps keep the population in stabilizing selection because of that. So okay. It, it could be totally well, we do possible. have some organisms that have died out because they were not able to survive. Yeah, most things um, do. I mean, that, that that's, happens a lot. That's the right? problem yeah, with okay, life. Okay. Yeah. Most okay. things go extinct. Um, it's, it's incredibly hard to exist at all. Why do they go extinct, though? Because natural selection was not enough to make them able to survive the next problem. Well, and, evolution, I, I mean, is evolution even the right word? Like, life in general is really incredibly inefficient, actually. Um, the, the only thing that allows organisms to continue surviving is the fact that there's so much uh, diversity within a population. Because you, you get, that's the only way to try and guarantee some some like statistical chance of being able to survive in a changing environment. I mean, the reason things go extinct is because the environment changes for so-called living fossils. The, the reason they are the way they are is because their environment doesn't change um, really at all. I appreciate you going there. Pressure. You went right there. You went there in the last debate too. Yeah. Like the coelacanth yeah, I fish. I wrote a paper on coelacanth in third you, grade. Oh, uh, crap. Okay. Uh, okay. Third grade. All right. Yeah. That's because you were playing Animal Crossing. <laughs> it didn't lie. exist in third grade. <laughs> I don't think. Um, a, another thing is, um, with this whole, like, mutations are bad thing, like, most mutations are bad, that actually, that makes no sense in, uh, in terms of, like, conservation. So, do you know what, so have you ever looked into like conservation efforts where like we try to rescue a species that is on the brink of extinction? Mm -hmm. Do you know what they, do you know, like from a genetics perspective, what they, what they look for, or what they try to do? Not Whoa. specifically. No, that was probably an extremely vague uh, and bad question, but they, they try to get the most genetic diversity that they can. And in fact, in the wild mm. populations are assessed they're they're basically like score for whether or not they are in danger of going extinct is not actually it's not solely based on how many of them there are because some organisms there just aren't very many of them like texas cave salamanders but they're not in danger of going extinct because what they look for is genetic diversity so conservationists know that genetic diversity is good but genetic diversity is only possible because of mutations you have to have changes uh, in order to even have that. If, if genetic entropy is true, it uh, and we have to uh, we have to take the the entire theory, which includes the assumption that most mutations are harmful. If genetic entropy were true, then inbreeding should be the best possible survival mechanism, because what that means is genetic entropy supposes we started with some sort of pure genome, and it keeps getting corrupted through mutations and whatever over time so i would I say well oh, go ahead well, Brandon. okay go ahead. well i guess i don't know enough on the effects of um inbreeding mm -hmm. to really comment exactly on what it does um 
But I would say that, so you're presupposing that the complexity in the gene code is available because of mutations? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, okay. Because that's something, and you, if, if you watch the debate with Cease and the Omnist, uh, trying to remember, uh, I forget her name too. Um, We're sorry. I don't remember either. I, you know, sorry. yes, I know. Especially <laughs> if you Artemis? watch Artemis. 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 Oh. Artemis. Okay. That's a yes. Um, that one of the things that we said was that uh, there's no evidence to say that you can actually gain information in the gene code uh, sustainably over a period of time. And that's kind of like our big thing. And that's when you get into the whole discussion between micro and macro evolution, you know, that we have all this evidence that you can down select the gene code, you know, and I always use this example all the time just because it's fresh in my mind, but to get from wolf to Pomeranian, you know, that's a big down selecting <clears throat> gene code. Um, but you can't do, you can't show evidence that we had to gain a whole lot of information, which is what you would need to get from very, very simple single celled organisms to what we have today. You know, so um, I, I, so I, I think disagree what with that. you just did. Yeah, right, right. You'd have to in order to believe in evolution. Oh, but no, it's I mean, just, I mean, it I, seems that you, to uh, okay, it. and that we should get to that too. But it seemed earlier you said that uh, these mutations are, um, uh, it, maybe I misheard you, but you you were saying that they were there are beneficial mutations um, to go against Sanford's work because we have a very diverse gene code, which would then be assuming the consequent. Where that's the very thing we're debating. Yeah, you you have to have genetic diversity in a population, or else it runs the risk of going extinct. Yes, so like, we believe that all of the organisms that god made through special creation on creation week had very high levels of genetic uh, complexity right um and that a lot of diversity and that over time um through natural selection they are uh it's down selected and so you actually lose complexity so you think time. that the okay that's that's interesting to me to me that doesn't make it it depends on the organism but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because we have recombination, right? I, I will only pass down half of my genes. Um, and if I, if I ever have a kid and my partner would only pass down half of hers, right? So, um, and there would be, I mean, if there are, I mean, if mutations happen, then that means that the, that the genome can't ever, so th this is weird. I don't see how you could have uh, your your population genetics at the time of creation, and then if mutations are random changes, I but we have non-random selection. I don't see how that could make the genome more simple. Um, that that would be something. Uh, seeing a, an experiment to to verify that would be extremely interesting. I okay I okay. Th I mean we've I mean we've allowed you know, bacteria to reproduce for th tens of thousands of generations. And, and I know their, their genomes have been sequenced, um, but um, I wouldn't, I don't know anything about any measurements of the overall complexity of the genome. Off the top well, of um, maybe a way to kind of measure this is, and uh, is when you look at phenotypes, you know, I'm not very educated on certain details in the genome, I will admit that. But when you look at things like what Adam mentioned earlier on the long hair and short hair dogs, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, genetics does show, if you have a, uh, I don't know, really cold um, environment move in to where all of the dogs with short hair can't survive anymore, um, now you've killed them off. And so that the gene code through natural selection now only contains information for long haired dogs. Um, you actually it, can't breed backwards. You now have lost the ability to breed backwards. Would you agree with that statement to where you can get back to short haired dogs? Not a hundred percent. So what I would say is, you know, for any population, there's, there's going to be variation. It's, it's not impossible, but it, but it's pretty rare that an allele would go completely extinct from the genome. Uh, you're always going to have some 
variation. Like, you know about the, the black and white peppered moths in England during the mm-hmm. Industrial Revolution? So the, the black moths all of a sudden became way more popular. But the white moths never went away, even though their, their um, fitness decreased dramatically in the environment. And then when the pollution went away, they came back, right? So I, I agree that you couldn't breed back. Well, I also don't agree with this exactly. You couldn't breed back the allele that you lost, but you can regain traits. Um, so I, I think partially we have like, a, I, I don't agree exactly with the framing that like the, the short hairs completely go away. That can happen. I. It's not super common from what I understand, but also there are traits that you can get back. I, I know of a really cool experiment with uh, bacteria that that's related to that that we can talk about later. Okay, okay. But with the moth example that you brought up, um, it never actually lost the white allele. Is that what you stated? And that yeah. later the white allele came back in the whole population. In, yeah, it got in... it got really rare, but it never disappeared. Okay. You know, like albino, yeah, we would need... albino animals, they never... Well, the the genes for it never go away, because or the but is that albinism it, with those moths? Is that albinism? No, I was just, just I was just drawing a comparison. Oh, okay. Like we never see okay. albino animals, but the alleles for it are in the genome. It's it's recessive, so you'll only see it if you get a particularly unlucky, depending on your on on the way you're looking at it, uh, inheritance. But but it okay. never goes away. It, there can be no individuals that are expressing this through their phenotype but it can still okay. be there but that's a mutation that can come up at any time right that's not like a specific this isn't gene really that's mutation. passed down so much right yeah, albinism isn't really a mutation I, well, I mean you don't get albinism from a mutation uh you get sickle cell or you can get leukemia from a mutation but albinism you are born with you inherit it Yes, but you okay, but you still inherit it. I thought as a mutation, it's not as well. You it, know, you know where all of your cells are not producing the melatonin they should be. No, yeah, mel- flip. melanin. Flip. I think melanin, melanin. 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 I almost <laughs> said melatonin. Oh my gosh, are you tired? <laughs> That's a different problem. No, I know. No, I'm not tired enough. That's the problem. <laughs> no. But yeah, okay. So uh, let's see. So the moth example would be more analogous if all of the white moths were annihilated because the industrial revolution, it would be something like that. You know, then I would say, can you then get them back? And, you know, um, you could theoretically, mm, but continue. so like, you know, like I believe you can't breed back from, uh, like poodles to a, a dog that now can, uh, their hair, stops growing you know because that's one thing with poodles is that their hair never stops growing so like uh they can't actually survive in the wild because there's nobody there to clip their hair so that eventually it'll yeah, get like long she- enough to where they, they can't move yeah yeah okay um but like uh so um is there any way to then do we have any evidence that would say that we could then breed back to get to we can to a more survivable form of like a poodle you know that's what i, I guess i'm saying here. so i i think we do um, okay. So the, this is actually what I was talking about just a little bit ago. Um, I, I don't remember. But I read this in a book by Jerry Coyne. Uh, it's probably a book you've heard of. It's called Why Evolution is True. But um, I, I don't know the name of the study or the authors, but it's talked about in there. I could, I could get it later and, and let you know. But what they did was they took bacteria, and we can, we can do genetic editing of bacteria. We've been, we've been doing that for a long time. We can make them do what we want them to do or, or not do what we want them to do. So what they specifically did was they removed the genes from these bacteria that allow them to digest lactose, right? So they made lactose intolerant bacteria, which is pretty funny. Now, um, most traits are polygenic, meaning like there's no gene. For, when you learn about Mendelian inheritance, you learn that Mendel, it's insane how lucky he got. All of the traits he studied were controlled by one gene, which that is not the way most genes work. In humans, there's no such thing as a gene for height. They've done genome-wide association analyses of people, and they found that the most significant gene accounts for about one two hundredth of your height. It's crazy. So it's the it's the interplay of many genes. Most of our traits are. But with the with the bacteria, 
we know the gene for uh, digesting lactose. <clears throat> Anyways, they deleted it. Um, now, bacteria can metabolize, they can digest other carbohydrates, right? They, they get most of their energy from glucose, I'm pretty sure. It's just that they can metabolize lactose too. But now these ones couldn't. And what they did is they just allowed these bacteria to reproduce uh, in a, you know, in a flask or petri dish, whatever, in water. And they, would, they had lactose in there, but it was an unavailable resource to them because they couldn't digest it. It'd be like if I, if I took you to, oh, like a salad bar and there was wood at the salad bar along with regular food. Well, you're not a termite, so you can't use the wood, right? Um, what they found was eventually the bacteria re-evolved, or I shouldn't say re-evolved, but they evolved the ability to digest lactose again. Now, they did not re-evolve the gene that they deleted because that's just, it's not impossible, but there are so many zeros that we can just say it's impossible, right? Um, oh. <laughs> but th there's more than one way to skin a cat, for lack of a better catchphrase, right? So they, they ended up, it was probably changes in different genes. It, it's probably not a brand new gene that mm. all of a sudden evolved, but a change in other genes that interact in complex ways that eventually gave them a metabolic pathway to digest lactose again. So highly, you're right, highly interesting. You're okay. right that we can't breed back like specific things. Like when an animal goes extinct, we can't take its closest living relative and then breed them to the point where we get the other animal back. You know, even if we bred them to the point where they are physically indistinguishable from the extinct thing, it still wouldn't be them because every organism is the result of its own unique evolutionary pathway uh, through its own descendants. And if we're breeding its most, its closest living relative, then that means it can never be that organism. We could just make it look exactly like it. Isn't it okay. for, for like lactose though? Cause I, I from what I've learned, um, we, 2000 years ago, something like that. We couldn't drink cow's milk. Uh, we, a lot of we people get, still can't. Yeah. Like they get lactose laughter. tolerance. And so the, the reason we can is because of a genetic mutation that allows us to drink lactose. Mm -hmm. So if we had two lactose intolerant parents, mother and father, right? It, wouldn't it just kind of be almost for lack of a better term, the luck of the draw that the child may not have the same thing. Um, Yes. Well, I'm, I'm actually confused what your question is. Like, are you asking like I, where did lactose tolerance in humans come from? No, I'm, I'm just saying like, so it, they, the child may not have that or may have the mutation to be able to process lactose. Um, and so in this instance, that would be, I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't have to necessarily breed a certain way. Like it could be you could get lucky and two breeding sessions of the bacteria, you'll get the result that you're looking for, or it could take a hundred. There's not, there's some like uncontrollables in there that just happen to, to work either for or against your favor. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Even if the bacteria never evolved the ability to digest lactose again, that wouldn't mean that they would be forever doomed or anything like that. Cause there are multiple ways for organisms to be successful. I, I mean, we know this because you go up to any ecosystem and there are, multitudes of different living things all playing the game of life in different ways and there are multitudes of different um uh organisms that are just subspecies of each other in that in that same ecosystem living out different niches okay. well hold on you mentioned something interesting when you explained that experiment with the bacteria um first of all that is really interesting that they were able to get that ability back to digest lactose but then you said something interesting it wasn't by resurrecting that old gene it was through some other mechanism that's already in place it was, it was okay. through mutations in genes but not the not the somehow serendipitous reacquisition of the gene that they deleted okay okay so it was a new so mutation then, that gave them the same the, the, the goal yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, okay yeah. okay but then that would still show that you know you can't um well it would show that it would be hard to well you're you're admitting you can't breed backwards and regain information that was lost i guess in the same way is what you're admitting maybe in a new way yeah 
Yeah, it it also okay. it would okay. also make no sense to do that because uh, again, the only way for organisms to continue to be able to exist and be successful is for changes is for there to be variation in the population and that variation to guide reproduction because the environment's like always going to change. So there's like there's no reason that evolution or natural selection would ever want to revert. Now there are mm -hmm. I mean, I mean mm -hmm. it is a fact well, that it or it's a uh, what would be an example? Like, you know, there have been several ice ages. Um, so, you know, Earth went from glacial maximums to it all melted. And then glacial maximums came back. So it's like, well, wait, the, the old environment is back. Let's breed backwards. Well, it, it just unfortunately doesn't work that way with, with evolution because the the, the alleles for, or the, yeah, the, I guess we could say the alleles for the genetic combinations or whatever for that to... to have good fitness during an ice age disappeared when the ice age was, was gone. So, well, I mean, you know, there are some things that can go back and forth, like the peppered moths. I mean, we could get, we, we could revert back to, but those never went extinct. So I'm rambling. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, no worries. Um, now I will say we do not, uh, believe in multiple glacial maximums. We believe there was one after the flood. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I figured I didn't want to use that as an example yeah, for that reason. That's but okay. I, but I couldn't think of anything else. Okay. But, um, Still, that would that would just mean that by saying that they couldn't uh, go backwards, I'm not saying evolution would want to do that, or you know, if we personify evolution, you know, or natural selection would go that way, but that just means there was a loss of information. And if there's a loss of information, well, that that's what I'm saying is how you characterize microevolution is is a loss in information, and and you don't just have little increases in information to get macroevolution, or you know to get from single celled organism to a horse you you have to have a large addition of information that happens consistently over a very long period of time you know it's it's not just um you know i mean we have evidence that a mutation we can have a couple mutations that will bring back some kind of capability that was lost but we would need evidence that that can happen on a gigantic scale we're not just getting back lactose capability we're getting a new arm you know, <clears throat> that kind of thing. That That's what makes it hard for us to fully believe that evolution is practical um, or because it's not observable. And all we see are these little changes. And then we have evidence, like you just mentioned, that you lose genes. But we don't so, see oh, a gain in large amounts of genetic information. That That's what I'm saying. So I would, I would argue against that for two reasons. One, mm -hmm. um, you can there are alleles that can be lost um uh, i'm not i'm not aware of any genes like entire genes i mean it it can happen i know it can happen because you can during during crossing over and recombination not all of the the genes can be passed on because the chromosomes will not equally swap information so you can lose genes that way i guess but even if like an allele is lost well you can regain new traits, right? So yeah, we are talking about, it is, I'm not saying that, I'm not even saying you're wrong. Yes, you can lose genetic information, but you can always gain new genetic information. And that's kind of the other thing you're saying. We don't, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you said we don't have evidence of it, but I think we do have evidence of, of new genetic information. So usually when I talk about this, people kind of say, yeah, but well, we'll get into that in a second. So myriapods like um uh, centipedes and millipedes and uh crustaceans so that would be like lobsters crabs and shrimp those are <clears throat> so these are all arthropods right they have an exoskeleton and segmented bodies right the reason that um crustaceans have uh, most of them i think are decapods they have five pairs of legs whereas insects only have three is because crustaceans have <laughs> more copies of the Hox genes that control for uh, limb development. So that is an example of additional information. Now people typically say, but if, but duplication of, I mean, we know chromosomal duplications happen, um, but duplications of pre-existing genes is not new information. It's just, it, it's, it's a copy of pre-existing information, but uh, clearly with crustaceans, the 
the copies of those genes have now been altered because they have, uh, the, like they have the claws in the front, for example. And arachnids have eight pairs of legs, but then they also have these weird things in the front. I can't remember what they're called. They have a really cool name. Just call them their fangs or their fangs. whatever. No, not the, it's different. The creepy fangs. looking things. So they have oh, the things, things that open up. On the, yeah. Yeah, they have their okay. fangs, and then they have these other yeah. things which are right next to it. I, I can't remember <clears> what those are called. So I think those are examples. Um, there are genes that humans have that we have more than one copy of. Um, I tried to do a quick chat GPT search. It only gave me one result. <laughs> Um, I was pretty. I'm pretty sure we have more than one copy of uh, this this gene that codes for vitamin C, but this is just giving me some ribosomal RNA gene. I don't, I don't care, I guess. But so that's my response to you can't get new genetic information. I would argue that you can, and I and I think we have good evidence to say that you can. By um, the duplication. By duplication of what's already there. Yes. But that wouldn't I so uh, Brendan was more getting at like it would take more than duplication to go from a single cell organism to us or to to you know something of that you know scale something you know it, well, you're going to have to duplicate it. you can't just duplicate what you already have as a single cell to to get to us there there has to be more I agree you can't just do that but again the du what the duplications do is they allow for you know, more than one copy of a gene, but then you don't necessarily need more than one copy of a gene and changes can happen in genes that have been duplicated and then it can be repurposed for something new. Uh, like the, uh, I, I don't think a duplication is what made the bacteria be able to redigest lactose, but we can see that changes in pre-existing genes can lead to uh, new characteristics. No, clearly there's evidence of new characteristics that can form um maybe even through some other pathway like with the bacteria that that's that's very interesting but then that is seems to be a different thing to say that that can happen um to say that you can gain large amounts of genetic information you know it, it have to be and we of course you could always say this well that takes millions of years we can't observe that then what we'd have to say is, well, is there some smaller uh, form of that that we can observe that we would know this could then build on itself and we can get a whole thing? Um, and because, uh, you know, a the natural selection that we do observe is the opposite direction, it just – the evidence that is usually used, the evidence that's usually used in support of evolution, macroevolution, is, is wanting because – all of that evidence is subtraction, but you are saying that there are some addition of some mean, things. What do you mean by I guess I would have to lose. I would have to look into that. Um, like when we're talking about, uh, well, you admitted that you lose some genes, and like in those that bacteria. So when they got the ability to digest lactose again, it was not by getting that old gene back, and so that just means in moving in that direction, they they lost genetic information. Is what I'm saying. Well, we forced um, it upon them. But I, I would argue that, <clears throat> yeah, the first well, thing is we, well, we then what you're point. arguing, what you're arguing then is that, you know, that hypothetical situation that we're thinking of, which has happened before, you know, where the short hair dog gene is removed because mm -hmm. or the phenotype is removed because of the environment change. Mm -hmm. You're arguing you, you can go all the way back. You can get the whole thing again. And, and that's not so much of shouldn't be thought of as a retroactive uh, action in the gene code, but it's more of um, just for survivability sake. I mean, if it gets warmer outside again, you hope that gene is still there so that they can then lose the long hair or, or, or else go extinct. Yeah. So I will, we've kind of drifted. I feel like we're, we're kind of still on, but we're kind of drifting away from the initial issue. And so the initial the issue history. was, yeah. Oh yeah. Can I, you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So at that, that genetic entropy and, and natural selection kind of clash. So I, I can go back um, to that. I'm happy to. Well, no, no, no. It, the reason I was saying this is because, so this was an objection actually that Dr. Stephen Sch Schaffner, um, he's a, po a population geneticist and computational biologist at MIT and Harvard. Um, and he brought this up to Sanford. 
Uh, this this was his response. So Sanford said they have not carefully thought through what they're saying. The nature of near neutral mutations is such that they are not only unselectable due to environmental noise, but they are also unselectable because they are noise to each other. Thus, as the number of neutral mutations accumulate, selection gets worse, not better. So if an individual carries just one near neutral mutation, it may be very weakly selectable, but probably not as environmental noise will override its tiny effect. So there will be little or no selection at all. If each individual has a 10, has 10,000 near neutral selections uh, or selection, not selections has to try and select for or select against all 10,000 conflicting mutational fitness effects. Simultaneously, 10,000 independent mutational fitness effects, usually bad ones, vanishingly blot, uh, vanishingly few good, will not be pulling, will not just be pulling in different directions with each other. They will act as noise, blotting out the fitness effects of each other. Haldane makes it clear that only a few mutations can be effectively selected simultaneously or for simultaneously. Trying to select for too many mutations at once totally overwhelms any type of selection. Indeed, selection interference not only prevents selection for countless near neutrals, it interferes with selection for more impactful mutations that are also accumulating. And so that is a way, way, way more elo eloquently spoken version of what I was trying to get across <laughs> was that... Yeah. Um <clears throat> What do you what is what is your response to that? I guess I can't. I know it was a lot because that was too much information. I know. Um, um, <laughs> I, I I I need to read that, and uh, so I'd I'd be happy to come back and talk about that. Um, okay. It, it, it was just too much. I was trying to think of. I know. Okay. What does this mean? What does that mean? What does it mean? And it was I just, put it in the comments if you want to pull sorry. it up and save it for the next time because that that is a lot. I was as I was reading, I was like, oh, this is. This is a lot. <laughs> yeah, is... that's, that's not to say that's not like good information or anything like that. I just, uh, in real time, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just, same, same. Be because it. that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, I was just saying because that was the. That's literally one of the things that an, an MIT professor brought up. I'm like, okay, this is, you know, a good question, obviously. So let's see what Sanford says. And so, I, I, I would, you know. I think that that's I, I think that's a good response. It's a way better way of saying it than I was trying to say it. I've got the uh, um, I opened up the link here, so I'll I'll take a look at okay. that. Um, that when we're done, or maybe maybe tomorrow. I don't know. Um, yeah. So j going back to genetic entropy. Um, so again, if you feel like I'm talking about the same thing too many times, that's fine because I have tons of other notes that we can talk about, but. I, genetic entropy neglects, I feel like it neglects the idea of beneficial mutations because it asserts that most of them are harmful. But it, it, it's just weird because I feel like your guys' worldview asserts that beneficial mutations must happen because, I mean, the only way for species to have radiated after the flood, for example, would be for genetic diversity to exist among the population and then for natural selection to weed out those with poor fitness or whatever. But there's also experimental proof to back this up. So if you, uh, these, well, oh shoot. Um, let me open up the, uh, I closed out of your live stream. I'll type this in the comments because <laughs> this, this is a resource okay. you can look into. I don't have the, I don't have the name of the paper, but I, the authors have really unique names. So Raphael, San Juan, Andres Moya, and Santiago Elena. Um, and I don't know what the name of their paper was, but if, if you search up, um, it's, oh, it's called a mutation induction experiment. So they, they did this with viruses. So they, they actually just forced viruses to get mutations. I'm not sure if they did that, like with a, you, you can use like a, like a neutron gun to do that. You, you can bombard DNA and force it, or you can just subject it to radiation. Uh, Norman Borlaug used to do that with wheat uh, in the early 20th centuries. Uh, nobody knows who Norman Borlaug is, and it's a crime because he's an yeah, amazing I, humanitarian. I've never heard of him. 
Uh, he th- there's a really amazing book about his life called The Wizard and the Prophet by Charles Mann. Uh, you got to read it. He Norman Borlaug basically two billion people exist because of him. He was a he was a green he was a green revolutionist for agriculture, which sounds like you're into like new age like good for the environment. But no, he he pushed like um, the use of pesticides and fertilizers and irrigation techniques into the developing world and rescued countless people. And he also was a very intense selective breeder with crops. Anyways, I'm sorry. How do you spell Borlaug, by the way? B-O-R- it's pretty much just like it sounds. B-O-R-L-A-U-G. Borlaug. Oh. Yeah. Norman. He's from Iowa. He's one of those good old boys. <laughs> so anyways, actually, that sounds like the South, so I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I'm from the Midwest originally, so. Um, oh. <laughs> sorry for that. But um, in this, so they forced mutations in viruses um, in completely random locations throughout the, I don't know if it was just RNA or just DNA or both. Um, But what they, basically the simple of it is they found that some of those mutations increased fitness, right? Um, A lot of them, and these were completely randomly interjected mutations done in a very unnatural way as well. Uh, Quite a lot of them were negative, but some were beneficial and so it's just to counter uh, Sanford's claim that most mutations are harmful. So I think one of the, the things, like, for example, you could look at the cave fish. And over time, natural selection to, or um, its genetic mutation, along with natural selection, took away its ability to see. It lost its, its ability for sight. So this would be a loss of ability but in this case, it was beneficial because the other senses increased and it's in a cave. So you can't see anyways, it's dark. And so now it's hearing, it's smell, it's taste, everything else increased. So that would be an example of losing something which would be beneficial. But, but I, I still. But not necessarily a gene. <clears throat> um, so they lost they lost an ability, but they're not necessarily. Th- this is different than equating it to a loss of genetic information. Because um, well, they lost the genetic information <clears throat> to properly see as a cave fish because those cave fish they, now are always blind. When yeah, but they they still probably have the genes for it. It's like, for example, in humans, um, where do I have this? I have this on here somewhere. Um, we have the gene for making vitamin C. Um, it's just that it has mutated to the point where it makes all the precursor molecules. There's just an enzyme at the very end that we no longer make properly. And so our bodies can't make vitamin C because of that. But we actually have the genes for it, right? So a a loss of function does not automatically equal a loss of genetic information. It actually might be, I don't know, on a case-by-case basis, I admit, I have no idea. But it's totally possible that you can add a nucleotide to a gene uh, and that makes the gene not function anymore. So this, but this would still kind of fall under a loss of ability through, I would say that was, that would be like, it would be fair to say that's a genetic mutation because a natural selection worked with it. Yeah. But it's not a loss of genetic information. Cause that, that's how it was framed originally. That was my only point. Well, it's a loss of the, the non mutated form of that gene to allow them to have sight. Or does, does yeah, that but not the gene sound is, right? is still there because we're talking about the preservation of the genome um, and we haven't necessarily lost anything from the genome. In fact, it may have been added to um, or if you just subst- or, or it could have been substituted. Like if you if you I'm pretty sure sick, yeah, sickle cell anemia is caused by one single nucleotide in our entire three and a half billion nucleotide sequence in all of our cells. A substitution of just one single nucleotide causes sickle cell anemia, right? So we lose, we don't lose the ability to have red blood cells, but their shape is corrupted by that. And it's through a simple substitution. So nothing's really lost or gained. Swap one thing for another. So all I'm talking about is I, I just, I don't agree with the framing that a loss of a trait means a loss of genetic information. Necessarily. Right, it, not it necessarily. It could be that, it but not necessarily. Yeah, it can. But okay, not okay. Necessarily. Okay. Hey, man, that's that's pretty interesting. I definitely need to look into that more. I have to admit. Um, the the next thing I wrote down was 
so Sanford's idea is that there was an the like there was a, an original genome free of mutations. Yeah. But so mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam. Right. Um yeah. so this this might be really hard and I did not write I did not write down the author for for this but if you look up um stickle ah oh shoot I didn't write down the authors for this uh for this research but it's with stickleback fish which live in like washington state oregon state i think um oh i don't know i I typed it in the chat you you may be able to find it i'm not sure exactly what to type in but we do this might not make good sense for me to explain It, it may just be too much information not enough visuals but they do these genome analyses um that show that the genes that organisms have um, are <clears throat> they come from a wide variety of haplotypes and a, a haplotype is just a group of inherited alleles so like your haplotype is your mom and your dad because uh, you, you inherited exactly two chunks of, of DNA from them right so haplotypes and haplogroups are something that like population geneticists especially when discussing human evolution use um to refer to like different groups of, of populations of people. We can do it with populations of any organism. So if you if you look at the genome of these of these sticklebacks, um, and this is not a genome, but whatever. When when we look at genomes, it's typically like you see this linear thing and then they mark the different genes on it, right? So what they do is they graph based on, well, I don't remember how they graph this, if it's based on like molecular clock data or whatever, but what you find is, sorry, I'm trying to draw a picture. I'm, I'm using my inner, I'm channeling my inner teacher and using a whiteboard here. So <laughs> this, this graph would be, um, we, are, we are graphing the timeline of when that gene or cluster of genes was inherited. So when did that particular haplogroup, a haplogroup, again, is just a cluster of, of alleles or whatever that you inherited, where did it come from? What we find is it looks like an EKG, right? If your EKG looks like this, you might be in trouble. But it kind of resembles an EKG. Whereas if genetic entropy is true, if all of us only a few thousand years ago are the stock from like an ancestral population that was already like pre-programmed with a, a more pure genome, then, well, where should I draw this? Then the graph should look like this. I didn't do a very good job of drawing a super straight line, but it should be, again, it's, it's time, it's more time up. So on the, on the y-axis, uh, the past okay. is up and the present is, is down. It should look more like this. The vast majority of, now mutations can happen later on down the road, but it, it should look, the prediction is it should look like this. The vast majority of all of our uh, haplogroups, the, these gene clusters that we inherit should be from the ancestral population with some changes occurring uh, along the way. Because again, in this worldview, Earth is uh, pretty young and there haven't been very many generations. Again, I'm not a... Okay, so aren't yeah, why? Things. Stats aren't my thing, so I couldn't, I probably couldn't unpack that a whole lot more but go ahead well that was interesting um you you the why is second, time. Guys. i'll be right back okay that's fine that's cool um the y axis is time mm-hmm. and then uh the x is what again it's, it's just different haplogroups it, it's the entire genome basically okay so it's, okay it's just these these are, we've just mapped the genes along the x axis yeah and then a haplogroup would just be like these individual clusters Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so when you have a bump or a dip on that line, that that signifies and like all right. It, it when the line goes horizontal that, and then it dips, yeah. it gets older because it goes greater on the y axis. When it when it dips down, it's it's more recent. When it dips down, it's like for okay. Example, oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's your orientation. Okay, so it gets younger. Yeah. And then younger. It's like, for example, with lactose tolerance, um, a lot of people don't have it. Some people do. So the, the idea is that 
the idea is that we didn't start with lactose tolerance and then some people unfortunately uh, lost the ability to digest milk. It's the other way around. So the ans so that haplogroup, the cluster of genes that allow us to digest milk, uh, would be a recent thing. So it would be a downward bump on this. So we would find the genes for that. And when we find when they were inherited, it's closer to the present day. Whereas the rest of the, the vast majority of the other genes in the distant past. Okay, so what you're saying is we have evidence that we can <clears throat> add abilities that we used to not have before, right? Um, or I wouldn't say abilities. I wouldn't say, say that was the point of that. The, the point is just to look at the genome and when have when what was the timeline of the inheritance of those of those genes of, of those clusters of genes, the haplotypes, and it it when you look at it again, it looks like an EKG. If we had genetic entropy, then we should expect to see the vast majority of all of the groups of genes that we have would be from, it would be pretty much a flat line almost all the way through the, the analysis with some downward ticks. I, I mean, I'm still having trouble understanding. This would be, I, this yes. would be, I should have, you know, this would be something that would have been more helpful if I looked into that study prior um, but this, so basically because the trend is more, it's, it's kind of like All not random, it, it, random. Okay. We can use that word as opposed to steady decline. It kind of, there's the issue, the, yeah, like, the contradiction. Almost. Me, me, I think I have a good way to put it. Like, it, like with dog breeding, like if you have a pure breed, right? Like, let's say there's this, this pure breed of dog that originally comes from the Netherlands and it, it's being still being bred today well if you wanted to know if your dog is a purebred um from that or just simply looks like it or is like a mutt or whatever if you wanted to know the the, the purity of your dog and whether or not it, it it's a pure breed from that original one you'd want to do this kind of analysis and if you find that the vast majority of all of its um the the, the timeline for the vast majority of all of its gene clusters are specifically from when we know that that dog breed in the Netherlands uh, appeared, then you would have confirming data that says, yes, what you have in the present is ancestral stock from this group in that specific place right there. But if it was all over the place, then that would be evidence of, well, maybe it's great, 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 great grand puppy was from there. But along the way, a bunch of its uh, offspring and, great grandchildren and whatever mixed with other breeds. Okay. So essentially with that data, and again, I have to look at this, it's kind this of study data here. Data test. That's, that's really kind of what it is. Yeah. So what, what it should show you're saying with genetic entropy, this is genetic is that... purity. Yeah. Whereas this is okay. Not. Top one is not. Hmm. Wait, wait, which one's genetic purity? The Say one that's again? more, the, the one that's more flat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. But that would be the genetic entropy one as well. That would that should represent genetic entropy. Or are you just saying that yes, in a, in a different sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. But and again, I well, well, never mind. So well does that but does that trend still show that the mutations are, are growing? Like it's not as if there are less mutations on that scale, or or is it showing that there are less mutations that, that it's fixing itself as opposed to mutating? Um, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what you mean to me. What it says is that what this particular population is inheriting is a great number of, of very slightly different clusters of genes. And the only reason that you can get that is from just like natural variation within the breeding population, uh, that arises from mutations. That's, that's the only way you can get genetic variation really. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying is like, I, I don't know how many generations of these fish that they have, you know, if they have five two, one generation of these fish, you know, with fish, they repopulate pretty quickly. And usually with animals like that, you could do something. I know with bacteria, they repopulate every day. So yeah, it, some of them. you can. Yeah. So some of them every you 30 could, minutes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you could use multiple generations to do this test. And so I guess what I'm wondering is how many generations did they do this test of? Did. Let's say there's parent fish 
uh, one, and then they have the next set of kids, which is the fish set two, and then three. That's it three does generations. Tell you, but I don't remember. I'm I'm almost certain okay. it does tell you. Um. Yeah, I don't know what to type in either. I I could find it. I got it. I actually got the study from a video I watched where they reference it. Um, so I, okay. I could get it to you later, but we have we have yeah, to send that. To, to cover. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so send that to me. We'll 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 have to get back to that because I'd be interested to take a look at that. I haven't heard of this. I haven't even heard of a stickleback fish, let alone this study. <laughs> yeah, there's, so. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of evolution uh, studies that have been done on them. I I can't remember what the heck the other one was. Um. The next thing I want to talk about is this got brought up earlier, but they're called compensatory mutations. I couldn't remember what the heck the word was. So that just means um, uh, the, the word there is like compensate, right? So um, even if, so even if we take Sanford, um, if, if we take the idea of harmful mutations seriously, even if there are harmful mutations, that doesn't necessarily, that isn't necessarily a, a nail in the coffin for natural selection because there can be compensatory mutations. So what these are is these are mutations that restore or improve the function of a gene. So you won't, you won't get, we talked about this earlier, you won't get the gene back. Um, in the example with the bacteria earlier, that was different genes changing. So we can't get the original one back, but um, other genes, mutations in other genes can help restore the original function of a gene that is mutated to the point where it's maladaptive, meaning it, it harms it. And there's a there's an experiment for this. So um, I will, again, authors with weird names, so I'll type it in. Um, Meis, Meisner Patton et al. 2002. And it's a... Uh, Sorry, and they studied Salmonella bacteria. So, what they did was, <clears throat> um, bacteria can can develop antibiotic resistance. Oh, so, I've seen this study. Is this the one with e. coli or H. pylori? No, this one is with Salmonella. I I heard of some resources or some okay. studies that studied E. coli, but this one doesn't. Now they may be studying the same thing, but this one isn't that. So, uh, they're studying Salmonella, and what they they found was this the salmonella bacteria does have antibiotic resistance to streptomycin um but the there's a there's a cost benefit ratio here they are resistant to streptomycin but they have reduced ability to reproduce amino acids and so therefore these ones the ones that are resistant to anti or uh, that are antibiotic resistant don't reproduce as fast as the ones that don't have it, right? So they have, there is an additional, there's a benefit, but there's a trade-off too. But what's really cool is they found, um, this is just directly from the abstract, because most scientific articles, you can't get access to the whole thing unless you pay like a Yeah, right. I, I put this one on. I think this one you can because it's National Library of Medicine. Oh, that's cool. Well, you you should yeah I, all the links I've clicked on within are pulling it up. Um, I, well, I, I see the abstract and I see similar articles. Well, I'll I'll take a, I'll take a look at this one, but um, <clears throat> this this is the one I'm I'm read up on. But okay, I'll just quote the authors. Only four of the eighty one evolved lineages contained streptomycin sensitive revertants. So, um, and that's what, the resistance. Yeah, so what they did was they, they had 81 different lineages that, that have, they're, they're resistant to streptomycin, but they don't reproduce as quickly. So what they did was they had 81 separate groups just continue to uh, reproduce over and over and over again, like the Richard Lenski experiment. Um, so four of them did revert back to uh, being susceptible to streptomycin. So th that's not exactly good. <laughs> they kind of lost function basically but only four out of 81 um all the rest the 77 remaining contained mutants that were still fully streptomycin resistant had retained the original resistance mutation and also acquired compensatory mutations 
So most of those com compensatory mutations resulting in at least 35 different amino acid substitutions were new single nucleotide substitutions. So the results show that the, the deleterious effects of a resistant mutation can be compensated by an unexpected variety of mutations. So in like human speak, not, not science jargon, they, they, they found that new mutations happened and really simple ones, single nucleotide uh, substitutions, I believe is, yeah. Um, really simple mutations happened that uh, uh, gave them, they gained back their original uh, fitness measurement. So basically the ability to reproduce at the original rate was, was regained in 77 out of those 81 lineages. So that's crazy because that's the opposite of what happened with, I mean, H. pluri, of course, is a different virus mm -hmm. or different bacteria. And I, th I don't know if the same thing happened with E. coli, but with H. pluri, the it, antibiotic resistance, the certain mutation would allow it to survive the antibiotics because normally when it, you would take the antibiotics, the H. pluri would produce this poison, which then kills it. And then yeah. this mutation didn't allow that to happen that, you know, for lack of a better term, you have the, the area where the, the antibiotic would go into and it was too small, it wouldn't fit in there. So it avoided making the poison to kill itself, but it wasn't able to reproduce. And so it, it ended up dying. Um, and that was specifically with H. pluri. So that's, the, I'll have to look into this one. That's that's interesting. Well, that um, one is a, um, a deficit that caused it to be resistant to the antibiotic. It's the yeah. port um, the one, the one, through which the, the bacterium takes... Is? Yes, yes, for H. pylori. H. pylori. Um, yeah, because the port of entry for any nutrients for the bacterium is smaller. So it actually can't take in some nutrients, which is why it's just unhealthy in general. But yeah. then uh, also because that port is smaller, it can't take in antibiotics, the poison. And so, um, yes, it's survivable there, but it's because of a loss of information. You know? um, but you're saying in this instance, there was this compensatory, if I said that right, gene that allowed it to gain, um, it to lose it, resistance it to the streptomycin as fast as it could before. That's what happened. While keeping resistance to the streptomycin. Yeah, seventy-seven out of the eighty-one remained or, or retained their resistance and okay. gained back and their, four uh, lost. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this compensatory okay. gene is compensatory. I'm saying this weird, but is uh something that was just already inside of salmonella that gave it the capability to do this? No, because they didn't have it at first. Um, it, it was mutations in probably pre-existing genes. Um, or, or it could have been, I mean, it, it may actually not even be, I mean, they say it, well, they, they know for a fact that it's mutations because they, they specifically list these amino acid substitutions. But it, it could be changes in, well, I don't know if, bacteria have epigenetics or not i think they do i think they have methods. i mean if they have I, dna then they would have to have epigenetics if well, they have cells in them then they, but they, have, but to they have to go have, through but they have to have methyl methylation sites um and i actually i don't think bacteria do because they don't have histone proteins i don't think so okay i um, thought I, all yeah, I cell structures would have to go through eukaryotes yes process. but actually i don't think prokaryotes do um but I'll, I'll look into that. But I'm almost certain that prokaryotes don't have histones. And so I don't think that. But I, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong about that. Um, this would be another, uh, well, kind of sorted. So you, you really, you have to read that paper from, or that, that article I sent on the defense of genetic entropy. Because this is, I think, the mutations and equilibrium refutation of genetic entropy. It's kind of like what we're getting into now. And he he addresses this yeah, again this has, along. Oh, this has Robert know. Carter and John Sanford in it. Yeah, well, no, that's the article with um, that's the responding to supposed refutations of genetic entropy from the. You're talking about oh, the, Carter's on that. Okay, yeah, about okay, the compensatory yeah, yeah, yeah. Adaptation yes. In the yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. I I didn't know if I had put that's the fine. other study in here either, but he does. There are four, five junk DNA. I've heard that one before. Six. He, he does quite a few reputations. Okay. He, he, this is luckily this has been around for long enough to where there's been enough back and forth, you know, chatter 
in this regard. Um, but just to say, I, I can't say it better than Sanford can, <laughs> the responses. So that's yeah. why I was saying it, it may be beneficial if we, if you read this, read, see if these are the refutations you would have, or you might find some of them to be just non-substantial. Um, and then, and go from there. Sure. Um, I only have, I only have a couple other things about uh, genetic entropy on, uh, that I wrote down on here, but one of the things, and this might be the thing that you take offense to is I, I actually don't see any empirical evidence to back it up to the extent to which it asserts. So like if, if genetic entropy is true, then all populations must be losing fitness unilaterally. Um, but they aren't because a population can't increase in size and decrease in fitness. Um, that, that really, that's pretty much impossible. Um, it's like for the human population, for example, pretty sure the human population, I think it's doubled five times since about 1880, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 1880 was the first time we hit a billion. Um, so I, I, that alone, I don't see how that can work with the, assertion that genetic entropy occurs what about like just can't have advancements? yeah i'm sorry both of you said something at the same time we'll go with what adam said well, I, I was saying medical advancements like our medical science has gone through the roof you know especially in the last 200 years so like we we can survive but longer to all life on the planet not just us but you brought well, up humans just as an example. It seems like yeah. there could be some other factor that's explaining why we have so many of us. Well, for humans, yes. But again, it, this would apply to all life. Okay, so yeah, you agree. Maybe true. humans isn't the best example for something that, though the population has increased, fitness. Uh, well, I mean, e yeah. even if... We'll we have were, animals even increased. If we in cheating, even if we were cheating through technology, which I, I would argue that we do... Um, and weirdly, there almost is something like genetic entropy in humans because of technology, because uh, there's no way you can argue that, that there uh, were the pop, the percent of the population that requires glasses today was the same as it was three, 4,000 years ago. Cause oh, LASIK. <laughs> yeah. well, well, I mean, those people just in the past went or like people who are type one diabetic. I mean, that was a death sentence only 50 years ago today. It's more common because those people can live longer. That that's sort of neither here nor there. But um, um, even if e even if we cheat with technology, we can't edit our genes yet. So you would still we would still have all these mutations pile up, and in in this much time, it's really hard to me to argue that. Well, you know, we have the industrial revolution, so we can combat the effects of genetic entropy. I think genetic entropy, as it's described, is way too powerful to um be mitigated just by you know the kinds of technology we have and most, most technology we we have we've only had for a few decades or a couple centuries which is well, when all of the explosion of population happened too it's only since uh, 1800s <clears throat> that we've actually had this exponential curve explode out yeah but 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 we should see our population decrease uh, before that point, and that that's never what happened. It, before what point? Before the um, before inflection it, and the increase. Before the hockey stick upwards, yeah. <clears throat> Why would we need to see that? Because because well, genetic our, entropy our, is happening. Yeah. So th that's I I think that it, for people like I guess we'll have to address before that technology point. jumps in before and c causes the curve up. Well, it's, I'm not it's, saying we know exactly all the reasons for that curve to start because, you know, it could just be a general uh, PAX, you know, peace uh, that would cause human life to increase dramatically. You know, it well, wouldn't necessarily have to PAX just Romana. be increasing technology. Yeah, like that's what I was thinking that, or Mongolica or something like that. I haven't heard Pax Romana since uh, middle school social studies. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> the, two, the 200 years of peace in the Roman Empire. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that 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 would attribute to it. Having more peaceful, you know, we have more uh, democracies and like we're a constitutional republic. Other governments that are more peaceful, less um 
what's the term about being too constant vulgar rating here? and it, you know it's feudal, less yeah, violent less yeah it's a, it's a good word yeah right there's less capital punishment for you know disobeying the government or, or, or whatever and then also like just the increases in childbirth capability less women are dying for, for childbirth we have That's more huge. possibilities with fertility because we have treatments to make you fertile even if you can't be fertile nutrition is better than it was 200 years ago and in, in prior like there are there are other things to counteract with what you would expect genetic entropy to do um i don't know about animals uh, i'm not sure that we have like what data we have to so show how old elephants or or tigers or whatever lived 500 years ago uh, i'm not sure that well, we... it wouldn't it wouldn't be their lifespan it would be their ability to reproduce would would be constantly or, or even that like what do we have that kind of data from that time ago to to be able to compare to today for humans um, we do but I, not for yeah, animals, i don't, I don't think going back going back thousands of years i i i'm almost certain that we don't have uh, population statistics on on animals but um <laughs> yeah um, i mean we actually do a little bit because they went extinct uh, so well lots of animals yeah. actually went extinct now you yeah, know you for, could argue well, that's natural because humans disasters did. almost certainly oh, yeah, yeah or quite a lot from masters. us we, we know for a yeah fact that yeah but as far as genetic pigeons, entry, we actually don't know. So, uh, elephant pigeons. birds <laughs> The passenger pigeon oh, yeah. one is wild. It was the most abundant bird on the planet, and we killed all of them in something like fifty years. Well, <laughs> like it's insane. Nah, we just wow. shot them all to death. It was wow. pretty sure. Pretty sure it was the most numerous bird on the planet. Pretty sure. Um, and yeah, wow. it's it's just really unfortunate what we did. What I want to uh, the the final thing about genetic entropy I want to say is, um, although I think it's totally bunk, there are ways in which it is true. But they're very specialized circumstances that I don't think model uh, the planet overall, the, the real world or whatever. So it, it is true that things like inbreeding and genetic bottlenecks and strong, if you have a small population, you get strong genetic drift. Um, those can cause harmful mutations to accumulate, but those things happen in situations that are totally unlike a typical ecosystem. Typical ecosystems don't have those really small numbers, but they also experience what's called gene flow. So gene flow is when somebody that's not from your population migrates to your area and introduces, uh, they're, they're still the same member of your species, but they come from a geographically unique area. So they, they introduce new genes or new alleles, I should say, not new genes. So, I mean, that, that happens. So it, it protects them from genetic entropy or whatever, um, as well as like the weeding out mechanisms of non-random mating, which we didn't talk about that at all, or sexual selection, which we didn't talk about at all. And that's fine because we've talked about a lot of things. Um, and uh, well, natural selection and a few other things. So I'm actually perfectly happy to say that something like genetic entropy happens in extremely small populations, like for example, on islands um, or with inbreeding, but that's not representative of the world in general. So, um, for example, um, I thought I wrote this down somewhere, but do you guys know that there were woolly mammoths alive when the pyramids were being built? I fully believe that. So yes. Uh, they were on Wrangell Island. It was, it was the last place on Earth that conventional science says that they existed. And Wrangell where is that? I Wrangell Island is an island between Alaska and Siberia. And, okay. Yeah, it, it's between there. So what happened was we're, we don't know 100%. Um, well, and I don't know, maybe maybe their their DNA has been sequenced. I don't know. But because they were on this tiny island, uh, they could not get, there was no um, um, uh, gene flow and the population wasn't big enough that they probably went extinct because if you if you have an extremely isolated population and you have all that inbreeding, eventually something like genetic entropy happens and you go extinct. Um, mm -hmm. That probably also happened to the Channel Island mammoths. So the Channel Islands are off the coast of California uh, near LA and there were pygmy mammoths on there and they went extinct, but they we don't, we don't have any direct evidence that humans made it to that island because uh, if we did, the be a good reason to blame humans. I thought those went extinct because of the temperature change. It, it's also possible. 
Um, okay. th- that's possible too. As, again, I'm not saying we know this, but an island is the kind of place, uh, a really small, because Channel Islands are really tiny. That is a place where you would see something like genetic uh, entropy happen. But again, I just don't, I think that the combination of natural selection itself, the fact that we know that beneficial mutations happen, I mean, they have to happen. Um, uh, non-random mating, partner selection or sexual selection and, and gene flow and all these things mitigate the supposed effects of genetic entropy. So in the, in the real world, I just don't, I don't think it really holds up at all. Genetic entropy doesn't. Well, I would agree that it definitely would be more, it, it's the effect is much more drastic from an inbreeding perspective. If you're all secluded on an Island and you have five different or, or, you know, a very limited amount of mates, especially with animals, because they're constantly reproducing to breed, they're going to die out. That's going to happen very quickly. Um, I, I would definitely agree that there's going to be a difference between a mass diverse population as opposed to a very selective, limited inbred population. I, I agree that, and I don't, I don't think that Sanford would disagree with that either. I think what, it, like the main thing, again, it's going to help after, reading these refutations to see if, if your questions are answered or if they're satisfactory, at least. Um, these mutations, they may be beneficial from a coincidental standpoint, that I am in a situation to where this is working, so it, it would actually help from a natural for, with natural selection. This would actually be a good thing to mutate. If I had this mutation, this would be good. But overall, you are losing an ability. Does that make sense? Wait, say the part about losing an ability again. So you're like the the fish, like the cave fish, or you're losing the ability, like a, a dog or a fox that becomes white haired or the polar bear that became white haired. They're losing the ability to produce the color in their fur that they used to. But this is actually a good thing because that helps them blend in with their environment. So this would actually go hand in hand with natural selection, although their genes are still mutating. Yeah, but that would go against genetic That's a good entropy, point. though. Well, that well, gen- is an example where it actually agrees with genetic entropy is you have a mutation that is added to the gene code that actually helped it survive, but in a circumstantial way, but in the long run can hurt fitness, which we know happens because like with the H. pylori example, you can have a change in the gene code that allows you to survive from the antibacteria, but um, not it makes it harder to reproduce, you know, uh, so. Yeah. That does happen but, sometimes. I'm trying to think. But the, the cave salamander example, we don't have any evidence that it's going to become harmful down the road yet, I wouldn't say. But also, um, the reason I said that goes against genetic entropy is because if that mutation, like they, they, they gradually lost their ability to see, but it helped with other uh, traits, like they're, they're probably more sensitive to pressure because that's how organisms that live in darkness, especially in water, typically find their prey, right? Um, then that that would mean that the mutation wasn't harmful because it increased their their fitness. And Sanford's, like, again, for the millionth time, his main thing is that uh, most mutations are harmful. And that they... The, the other thing... This, this is part of the thing that we didn't really get into because I don't, I don't really have the the mathematical skills to talk about it. But, but he, he insists that the implication is because of that, the frequency of harmful mutations must necessarily continuously increase. And I would argue that, that we absolutely don't see that because we don't see populations uh, declining except for cases where like we are causing extinctions, but it has nothing to do with the, the genetics of the, organisms it's us changing their environment they were doing perfectly well before we start screwing things up with pollution and whatnot hmm. well, that, were you gonna say something Brent? <clears throat> well i want to ask about uh if what you believe about the um the idea of entropy as a whole <laughs> um <clears throat> because if genetic entropy isn't true it seems like the one thing entropy doesn't touch is living organisms, which would be um, <clears throat> strange um, and hard to substantiate. 
Uh, are you familiar with just f- entropy and physics? Um, so, you know, I thought I was, but I have a friend who's a PhD in physics and he, he, I, I'm actually writing a book and I had him critique it and he's like, you're confusing energy and entropy a lot. And I'm like, but, but aren't they the same thing? He's like, no. Um, so like one leads to the other, but so mm-hmm. I, what I, entropy is just, there are actually many different ways to describe it. So like low entropy would be like the, the temperature of something decreases because low entropy means you have more organization, right? So the colder something gets, the the smaller its distribution curve of its temperature is. Or we can say from a organizational standpoint of matter, lower entropy means that matter coalesces into like, um, like, like a neat array. Mm-hmm. Entropy mm-hmm. increases over time, meaning that everything, like erosion happens. That's a very good example of, you know, a mountain has sort of structure, kind of, sort of, but eventually just becomes flat, to a, to a point of its lowest potential energy, which is a way of saying it like maximizes um, its entropy. So, well, anyways, I, I, I want to pull something up real quick, but go ahead and continue okay, with whatever okay. you wanted to say. Okay. So, yeah, entropy is a measure of disorder and randomness, we could just say. Um, and, right, there are multiple ways to describe it. But, you know, just according to the second law of thermo, um, entropy is always increasing in a closed system. Mm-hmm. Which is, I mean, I don't think there's any debate there. That's one of the most established laws in all of science. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, that's not going anywhere. But um, so what that then translates to directly in thermodynamics is that uh, there are always parasitic forces that take energy from a useful state and convert it to a useless state. Exergy is the definition. Definition of that is basically energy that is useful useful energy um and that's it's always in a closed system decreasing because of these parasitic forces like friction or resistance in wires um things like that and uh but then that translates to something bigger than that um that exists in you know the whole universe in fact you know one thing that we do and physicists have done this now for like half a century is uh prove that the universe cannot be eternal they prove against the steady state theory by saying that okay because of entropy everything is winding down we have a level of order now but it can't have always been like that at some point the flashlight has to burn out so to speak you know and and that's the idea that all of the energy that's ordered will become disordered but then entropy just it goes on uh, the idea of it goes on to say that just order is not added by nature. Um, <clears throat> it is only uh, removed. Yes. You know, so classic I, example, you put a car in the woods and it doesn't gain functionality. It, you know, it yeah, just rusts. Rusts. Yeah. Um, and so I'm thinking just with biology, I, to finish the thought, is that in order for us to say that genetic entropy doesn't exist, we we would be saying that the gene code is the one thing that is exempt from uh, this overall phenomena of disorder, the growth of disorder. Sure. Would you be saying that? No. Um, So it's it's basically like evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics. It is kind of essentially what you're saying, right? Yes. Well, I think he's more just saying you could say that, but in this specific well, context, he was saying just saying why it does. It's yeah. it's not exactly the second law of thermodynamics because the second law of thermo isn't directly related to everything like rust on a car. Mm-hmm. But um but that the idea well, that it's, it's nature does not add order. Yeah. So um I I'm writing a book and I have a section on this, and um I'll just I'll, I'll just read these like two paragraphs to it. So um the, the problem with that state, the problem with saying something like evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics or like we couldn't preserve our genes because of it is that Earth isn't a closed system. Yeah. Um, it's an open system and life is an open system as well. So what makes our planet and life part of an open system is the sun. The sun continuously provides Earth with an endless quantity of very, very low entropy energy. Uh, that low entropy energy comes in the form of 
photons. Um, and it's taken in by photosynthesis and converted into higher entropy living mass uh, with tons of it lost as waste and heat. Um, you, like, for example, if you're going to have a farm and you're going to have cows, you have to have vastly more food for the cows. The, the, the weight of the food has to vastly outweigh that of the cows because so much of it is lost because of inefficiency. And that's entropy in action. Um, I went off script there for that. But um, the, the entropy increases at every step of the ecological food chain and energy is lost to the environment as heat. Um, this is why there is vastly more plants than herbivores and vastly more herbivores than carnivores. So nothing in life well, is 100% that- efficient. So while it's true that living things are low entropy compared to their environment, um, like I'm more organized, I'm a more organized form of matter than my environment, um, that's only in their organization. Uh, Living things being organized forms of matter still lose vast amounts of energy into their environment. So we are actually contributing to entropy by doing that. So Mm -hmm. the other other major problem um, is that evolution and life in general are also non-random because that, that's kind of another part of it. Uh, the, the entropy increases because the, the random actions of particles interacting, moving, or whatever will always lead to disorder. But um, that's probably all I need to say about that. That was probably a tangent. We didn't need to go on, I guess. But <clears throat> um, anyway. First of all, kudos to writing a book. Uh, that's cool. Second, it's a work how process. is, yeah. um, how is evolution not random? Because of natural selection. So how the, is natural selection ultimately not? That's random? just a process, though. That's descriptive, not prescriptive. Yeah. So the what causes genetic variation among a population that is random, but that's not natural selection, and that's that's not really evolution either. The fact that the fact that only some organisms. Uh, so you have a population and there's, you know, we have, we have a bell curve of, of fitness or whatever. Um, the fact that only the ones that are best well suited have statistically greater odds of reproducing, that's the non-random part of it. You don't get, like, it, it's literally called non-random mating, right? In like I wouldn't terms. use a bell curve to dispel randomness because your variable is called a random variable in doing statistics. It's assuming random, a random distribution. Well, but we can actually, well, we can actually quantify this. We, we don't have to just assume it. It can be counted, but, but no, it's it, also natural selection is well, totally not random because only, only a small number of the members of any population reproduce. Right. So th- the forces that guide, evolution are are non-random the things that produce variation are are random um but not not selection itself so survival of the fittest isn't even fully accurate because it's really survival of the luckiest frequently you know it's not simply you know oh you have the best genes you will survive and so it is a directed process like what you just said the environment can change and things will happen there that will make it like that but it's also time and place you know to put it all to a specific math inside the bounds of putting natural selection inside the bounds of survival of the fittest would ignore a lot of the disorder that actually exists in the circle of life um i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure what you mean by that um, again, Just the, the that, original thing was natural selection itself isn't random. Yes, and I'm saying that it is. Uh, there's how, we how can't come, remove though? randomness from because there's no uh, ultimate purpose behind it. Yes, it happens to be that you you know certain characteristics will survive easier than other characteristics. But that is not incompatible with randomness. Do you know what a Galton board is? No. So a Galton board is just, you know the game Plinko on The Price is Right? Mm, no. <laughs> so that's the thing. It's like you have a slanted pegboard and you drop like what looks like a, a, a connect oh, for a checker thing. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up somewhere 
random. The path it takes is going to be random because at every peg, there's a 50% chance it goes left, 50% chance it goes right, right? So it, everything about that is random. However, if you were to graph the distribution of where they end up, you get a normal distribution. So a Galton board is, I have one in my classroom. I, I was going to bring it home and I, I forgot to, but what it is, is it's just a, a whole bunch of tiny little metal beads, like, like tiny little BBs or shots or whatever. And you drop them down one of these, it, it's a pegboard thing, and they form a normal distribution. So it is, out of chaos, patterns emerge. Out of the total randomness of it'll either go left or it'll go right, the, the statistics at the bottom don't end up that way because in order for it to go all the way to the left or all the way to the right, you'd have to have a specific left or left. So every time it could go left or right, you have to go left every single time. That's the only way to, one of the only ways to end up on the far side. And that's very rare that that will happen. So yes, there, there are elements of total randomness in there, but you can get a pattern out of that. And with natural selection, what I'm saying is there is inherent randomness in the process, but the outcome is very much non-random because uh, it mates or so this isn't how it works for bacteria, obviously, but like females usually choose a mate. There are, there are some species where uh, it's the other way around, which <laughs> those species are kind of funny because they've like flipped family dynamics or whatever. Um, but because of that and because of, um, uh, I mean, I mean, just the, the genes you inherit are, yeah, it's going to be random. Maybe you are lucky and you have a good immune system. Maybe you're not lucky and you have a crappy immune system. Well, the fact that most organisms in the environment don't have crappy immune systems is not random. It's because those that do have good immune systems have statistically the best chances of surviving long enough to reproduce. And so the population represents them because they reproduce the most. <clears throat> I don't know that that's incompatible with randomness only because when you have certain guidelines, mm, phenomena will land in a certain direction anyway. But like with the bell curve, um, it kind of – statistics presupposes randomness. You actually need randomness in order for statistics to make sense because otherwise it's like you're messing with the data. Um <sighs> That's why they call it a random variable. Um, I'm trying to form what I'm trying to say better. Because if it wasn't random, that would mean a. I usually think that would mean a mind is involved. Well, so this is the so like well, the if we define the organisms have something like conscious. I, I would argue that almost any living thing has some kind of consciousness. That's not the same thing as a mind to me, but organisms. They don't necessarily, I don't think a bacteria does anything for a reason, but there are reasons why bacteria do things, right? But this is, this is the natural selection. I, I don't want to cut you off, but the, the, the topic was, is natural selection random or not? And I would argue you do need a mind to have consciousness, but that's another topic. But uh, the, so like, if we just look at Google's random definition, made, done, happening, or chosen without a method or conscious decision. I, I wouldn't say that natural selection, you could say, you definitely can't say it's a conscious decision because there's no consciousness behind nature. Um, is there a method? I, I don't think it's necessarily a method. I think it's, I mean, you could break it down to a coincidence. I just so happen to have long hair in cold climate. I just so happen to have short hair in uh, warm climate. I just so happen to be bigger and stronger than the predators around me so I can survive. You know, the, I mean, that, that's... That's what evolution stands on is chance. That's what it's supposed to be. Uh, when you say it's not chance, you're saying it's design. I don't. I don't no. know that we have a third option. Is that do we have a dichotomy here? You have well, chance. You have design. There's again. There's two things happening here. The the environment. Whatever changes happen in the environment, that is that's random in the sense that it's unpredictable. I mean, I I think we live in a deterministic universe um so actually it is wow it is sort of predetermined what will happen a thousand years from now right but we don't know what it will be and the shuffling of genes obviously doesn't know the future either right um so like that's random and the genes that i happen to pass on 
are randomly reshuffled and any mutations that occur occur because of random chance but again the odds the statistical odds of surviving long enough to reproduce are not random and that's why it affects the population that's why the population represents not a bunch of sickly albino the animal like i'm just trying to think of traits you don't want you know stick out like a sore thumb and have a crappy immune system and i don't know have 20 legs because you have some sort of random duplication or mutation or whatever that's why the population doesn't look like that because of the non-random uh aspect of reproduction okay would you then so you disagree or do you <clears throat> agree in that dichotomy between chance and design what was the dichotomy again if there's it's non-random that means it has to be designed there's either yeah no what, what do you call it if it's not chance or but it's not designed? i think your inheritance is chance um but I, I don't think the survivability thing is is chance because um i'm not i'm not exactly sure but it, I don't think it has to be designed because if we if we live in a universe that operates according to like fixed natural law, then there are reasons that things happen, and so it it's understandable why certain things would be favorable to other things because certain things have a better fit with the environment, which is under like which is shaped by the climate and gravity and like you know whatever else, just these natural forces. Well, we would say that is in indicative of a designer making the natural laws. Um, <clears throat> well, I, th I think we'd be arguing something totally outside of evolution at that point. Um, it it would yeah, be outside would be, of evolution. Even if, yeah, even, that'd be teleology. Actually, actually, even if, I don't, th this doesn't necessarily um, validate your worldview because this would validate a deistic worldview as well. Because well you're, said, well you're, said. You're, yeah. you're saying that just not agnostic atheism. Yeah, you're just saying not naturalism. <clears throat> you're saying the environment is the way it is, and our universe does what it does because a designer set it up that way. But it could easily, it could just as easily have been a designer that went, All right, do your thing, um, and yeah, and that, and does not true. intervene. It would be actually, it, it would be indistinguishable from my worldview that posits that there wasn't a designer that made everything happen in the first place. Well, that's, that, that's why the separation would be from naturalism. Naturalism would be excluded once design is thrown in there and you'd have theism, deism. And if you want to say that, uh, um, pantheism is not in there with deism was some people would disagree with that. Some people do. Um, so I would say that would either way that, that goes design would imply something, you know, beyond nature. Something that's that's done a uh, made a design. But we've we've actually I think we've hit two hours here. So I think this is a yeah. unless you guys have something that you wanted to throw there it was, on the table. There was I, I'm I'm perfectly happy to come back. There's one other thing, which is that mitochondrial Eve paper that you referenced. And I, I had some yeah. things and I could just go over them quickly and we could we could talk about it more next time or whatever. Um, and then I also okay. had uh, some stuff about transitional fossils. I, I focused on Pachycetus for the most part. We definitely, uh, we definitely don't have time for that. About. We definitely yeah. don't yeah. have time for that. But um, if you're if you're willing, it would take me a few minutes. But I could just talk about that paper. All right, we can do that. We can do that real okay. quick. Um, so instead of before, where I went through bullet point and then like, what do you think about that? I, I, I'll just go through these because, again, I don't want to take a whole ton of time. But that paper is called The Eve Mitochondrial Consensus by Robert Carter. So 2007, right? Yeah. So yeah. I don't think you should use this paper as a resource. I think there are, there are a lot of problems with it. Uh, the, the first thing is it sort of violates the spirit of what the intention of the argument from the beginning was which was that we were going to try to divorce ourselves from like a, a biblical nar perspective or narrative, right? Because um, I know, Brendan, you haven't read the paper, but the very first thing that, that the paper says is, um, in order to develop a biblical model of human genetic history, and then it goes on, right? Um, so to me, that's 
confirmation bias. It because it deliberately is set up to back or set out to back up a conclusion. And that's not the way science is supposed to work. Now, everybody is biased. People are biased and biased people do science, but the methodology shouldn't be biased. And I think the immediate reading of this paper shows like a really biased methodology. Uh, the author in the paper says things like uh, most of the evolutionary assumptions have been questioned in the scientific literature. And then right after making that claim, the author cites himself. So he's not actually citing the evolutionary literature. He's citing a paper that he wrote, which, which is very different, right? To me, to me that's almost what like a What website are you reading that on? What website are you reading that on? Is that the National Library of Medicine? No, it's... Um, I have... Here it is. Um, it, it, it's, his, it's his paper, the, the Eve Mitochondrial Consensus Sequence by Robert W. Carter. Okay, because that's not what it says on National Library of Medicine. So they may have like one that's tailored towards creationists and then one that's because that would never have been accepted in the National Library of Medicine. Once they say biblical time, no, that wouldn't. Because <laughs> this was actually done, it, Robert, uh, Robert, John Sanford did this with Robert Carter, but he couldn't put his name on it because by this time, they wouldn't have accepted it. He was already, I think, done with Cornell. I think, and I think you're talking about a different paper because he has two papers on this. Um, and I have... Mitochondrial, this one is mitochondrial diversity within human populations. And it's the one where they took 827, uh, 827 carefully selected sequences showing modern humans uh, going back through gene sequencing, mere 21.6 NT sites on average. 84.1% of the mitochondrial genome was found to be invariant and private mutation and private mutations yeah, accounted for 43.8. Yeah. So I, I think it just may be the site that you're reading it on like this. I see what you're saying. It's not from a scientific point of view. You want to remain neutral. You don't want to say I'm doing this to prove the biblical timeline. But what I would say is that if it was accepted into the national library of medicine, it's because the science was legitimate. It wasn't, there was no right. like foul he, play. I think he wrote two different papers um, on the same thing. Um, so, but, but th if anything, like I, I hear what you're saying, like this uh, wouldn't have been accepted, but if anything, uh, cause he is a creationist. If anything, yeah. th the paper I'm reading really actually represents his views. Um, I, I'll just do a couple more things and then we can, or say the rest of what I wanted to say, and then we can, round this off or whatever um um so he carter he rejects the methodology of other mitochondrial papers on the grounds that they assume we have shared common ancestry um the paper explicitly claims the genesis flood happened the paper claims that mitochondrial dna supports the tower of babel story uh, because in some studies that the author references women have a higher migratory rate than men and supposedly that fits in with what it says about the Tower of Babel. They were scattered according to paternal lineages or something like that, I think is what it says. Um, he actually uses the phrase direct confirmation of the of the Babel account. Um, so I feel like that's kind of cherry picking because there is mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome analysis that shows that in some groups, men travel more. So I think he just sort of cherry picked something. I only have a couple more things. Um, the paper outright rejects the, the um, sorry, the paper outright rejects the clear reading of phylogenetic maps of humans in Africa and proposes several hypotheticals that have no evidence for, um, they're, they're just arguments. And he admits that in the paper, um, including, so this is where it gets actually kind of really bad. So this is something that he wrote. So he says that um, the humans in Africa idea probably isn't true because uh, he writes that Africans have, quote, defective DNA repair systems. Um, and that, uh, so I, I don't think that's something you should say, but he also says analysis of lifespans of patriarchs shows how the average age of marriage changed dramatically downward in the first generation after the flood. So he, again, he's just sort of, it's from that uh, 
biblical perspective that we were talking about earlier. Um, we have it, the the actual evidence says the exact opposite of what he's talking about in here. He he needs to believe that humans originated in the Middle East because he thinks that's more biblically accurate. But the greatest genetic diversity exists in Africa, which is exactly what you would expect for if a population originated somewhere. Um, well, Northern a, Africa would be like pretty like Middle East, Northern Africa is the same geographical area. So yeah, it's, but it's not the, that far off. The, the diversity is really in sub-Saharan Africa, which is, which Wait, is, which why is does he, away. why does he need the, the Middle East to be the place of highest? Uh, Cause that's where he diversity? thinks the garden of Eden was. He doesn't think that. Where does he think it was? He, th he well, he, he the pre flood Earth originated in the Middle East. So, um, he maybe he says that that would be weird because young Earth creationist uh, belief on that is that uh, before the flood was Pangaea, and that under the flood, all of the tectonic uh, activity happened. I mean, it was not tectonic drift; it was sprint, and uh, that caused all of the uh, continental formation we have today yeah. so the earth didn't even look the same um and this kind of makes sense you know because you have huge sedimentary blankets all over all of the continents and um it would have been laid down by a flood and so to say that oh the middle east before the flood would have been the same as after the flood would have been kind of crazy it would have been way different well, if if, uh, if earth if if we had pangea and it just broke up then the pretty much every uh place is preserved it just breaks up it like if you took a puzzle that was put together and then broke it apart you don't have you don't have more or fewer pieces the, the everything's the same um so the locations are still you know discrete from each other they just move into different places actually uh no 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 the younger creationist view of the flood is it's very violent i mean there's a lot of silt and stuff moving around um and so I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I do see what you're saying, uh, but actually I just found an error in my logic anyway, because the Bible still says that they landed in the mountains of Ararat. So that's still Middle East. But that um, wouldn't be the, so you'd have the bottleneck and then the population, you can still go back to Adam and Eve, which this study is supposed to go to Eve, not to Noah's wife. So that, um, well, no, because if, if Noah's family are the last living people, that that would make them the that would make one of them mitochondrial Eve. But they would still be descendants of Eve. Yeah, but um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I I mean, Adam, I have to admit, like that would still mean wherever uh, Noah and his family landed, you would think should be the place of high of highest genetic diversity yeah. it doesn't necessitate they, they that because be... they could have moved but yeah. um it it suggests that that was the place of highest so genetic a mito diversity. a mitochondrial eve only means um that <clears throat> the mitochondrial eve is a person who everybody alive is related to but it's not the first person so if if somehow everybody on earth died except adam you and your family then a hundred years from now, um, your wife would be mitochondrial Eve. Uh, but that wouldn't mean that, that, that your wife was the first woman or anything like that. So Noah's family, somebody in Noah's family would still be mitochondrial Eve. It wouldn't be Eve Eve. Yeah. The mitochondrial Eve mm. data actually forces a, um, bottleneck genetic or population bottleneck. Which is another way of getting back to the flood, though we'll have to admit most scientists won't do that because they believe that, you know, that brings in su the supernatural. They'll, they'll say there was some other bottleneck, but it is a backdoor way of saying, eh, the flood has a point. Um, well, let's go ahead and if you have more points, because this go ahead and read off the rest of your points because this is a totally different paper than than what I'm looking at here. I I'll put this again in the chat so you can see. Wait, did I do that? Or, no, I'll... you didn't yet. I think it's okay. I think it's the same paper. I think he just wrote uh, what he wanted to say in this one. Um, yeah, question. yeah. One was meant to be um, placed in a, you know, uh, professional yeah, um, this is, this library. Is the same, or this is the same. It, it's the it's the exact same 
thing. Because 827 is exactly what he says in here. I'll, I'll read through more of it. But um, though I only had a couple other things. Um, in, the, in the one I'm reading, he used a computer simulation from something called Mendel's something. Do you remember that being in this one? Uh, I think so. Is it Mendel? I don't uh, Maybe it wasn't Mendel. I can't remember, but he used a computer simulation. Um, and he gave it a population size of only a thousand, which is really small. Um, but he did that because he wanted it to be quote unquote, biblically reasonable. Right. So like we all have presuppositions, but again, I, I said this before, but I think he kind of corrupted his methodology here. So, and then the last thing is this one was published in the journal of creation and uh, this guy works for, well, I don't know if he works for them or, or what, but it was funded by a group called the Feed My Sheep Foundation, who's, if you go to their website, um, it's a really weird name, but if you go to their website, it, it's currently dedicated to this conspiracy theory that children are being taught sexually explicit content in schools, and that in their own words, a quote unquote sexual holocaust with billions of victims is currently happening. So I only say, I don't mean to say that as an ad hom against the guy i'm just talking about i think that we that it's like deeply flawed in its methodology because it comes in with a lot of baggage and bias i'll have to so like with the children being taught sexuality like is he saying this or this is what this company is saying the people that fund him say that he works for them um because that's it's it says that's where he's from robert carter Feed My Sheep yeah. Foundation, blah, blah, blah. Give its address and all that. Because I know he works for Creation Ministries International, which is a, a creation science company. Um, yeah. But oh, I mean, as like far as Elon Musk but, works for 10 companies, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. But like that's, if you want to look up Robert Carter, you go on YouTube, you want to watch lectures of him or something, you mm -hmm. go to CMI and you'll find him. Um, but this this would be, again, though, that would be like with the, the sexualization of kids, you can call that a conspiracy theory, but like there's tons of videos of teachers literally admitting they're teaching kids like things that they should not be learning, talking about sexual activity, sexual things in classes. In fact, there are lawsuits and like, staff all over the country that have been fired um, and criminally charged for doing these things. So I, w I wouldn't call that a conspiracy theory. I don't know how far this company is taking it. If they're saying this is every single classroom across the U.S., that's Well, they say true. there's billions of victims. Um, uh, this, is a, this would be a very different yeah, conversation. Yeah, that would be weird. There are, a lot of, yeah. there are a lot of misconceptions about <clears throat> this. Um, if I can just say something about it for, ten, for 30 seconds. Younger kids are being taught uh, things about their their anatomy uh, and it seems extremely off-putting to to a lot of parents and then it gets through the telephone game of I heard I heard I heard it it turns into their doing like sex ed to like third graders or whatever but the reason they do that is because what research has found is that children who are sexually abused don't even know what's happening to them because nobody teaches them what their bot what those parts of their body are for and so they literally can't tell people what happened to them and so that's why that's why there's a concerted effort in a lot of places to teach kids about their bodies and other people's bodies i agree you probably shouldn't teach a shouldn't necessarily teach a second grader what sex is but if they're being abused and they have no idea what the hell is happening to them then actually maybe there's an argument to tell them what those kinds of things are so that has nothing to do with evolution <laughs> i just i'm a teacher yeah. and i want to defend yeah. teachers i guess but no, that's fair. That's totally fair. Um, well, well, so that's uh, we'll have to look into those those outer issues that can potentially roll into this. I would advise that you look at the National Library of Medicine article because that doesn't have that. In, he doesn't have like a biblical. And and I'll say like to the contrary, when you have like uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Lewinton, right? Um, nope. He was a, a American evolutionary biologist, a mathematician. I think he, atheist. He, he died. Yeah, he was a big time naturalist, a mathematician, geneticist, social comment, um, social commentator as well. Um, and I, I want to say he worked. Can't remember what school he worked at. Now, I'm, I'm, oh, he was at. Uh, I think he was at Cambridge. Um, 
And then he was part of the Guggenheim Fellowship for Natural Sciences. A very, very well-known person. Um, and so he was one of the guys that was part of this, you're not allowed to mention God at all in science. And we're not allowed to let God in the door. And so I think this is kind of like the extreme, like the extreme end on the one side would be that it, everything with science has to match up with the Bible. We're not going to do science unless it's going to match up with the Bible. That's too extreme. And then you have the other end where it can't possibly be God. There's no way everything can be, can be explained through naturalism. And, and I would argue like there are many, you know, like we, kind of we were mentioning earlier, consciousness. I was saying, I think you have to have a mind to have that. I think I don't think naturalism has an answer for consciousness, but that's that's another argument. But again, there's two extremes and you have to meet in the middle. You have to be like, OK, leave our presuppositions. Whatever your worldview is, is irrelevant. If you just do the scientific method, you can arrive at a, a fair scientific conclusion. I think this paper portrays that in the National Library of Medicine. I got to look at this this other one that you're talking about. But um, other than that, we we are almost at two and a two hours, yeah. <laughs> two hours and thirty minutes. What anything else that you wanted to mention before we we hopped off here? We definitely have to come back and and do another session on this because there's a lot more to talk about. And I, I had a lot of fun. I think this is a great conversation. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got to talk about Pachycetus next time. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, okay. sir. No, I mean I I I appreciated it and it it was really good. Um, most of my most of the conversations I have are with <laughs> are with people who don't have a clue um, about about anything, and I don't I don't mean that I disagree with them. I disagree with a lot of people, but they just oh man, they don't even know what they're talking about. And you guys you guys are totally fair and polite and and know things, and so uh, it's a nice change of scenery for me. <laughs> uh, happy to not be that flat earther or anti <laughs> yeah. yes, sir. Yes, anti dinosaur sir. existing anti person. Oh, I saw someone in the comments kept saying dinosaurs, dinosaurs don't never exist. existed. That's probably <laughs> yeah, a troll like, from one of my from from a follower of mine. I have I don't know, okay. but that's what I would guess. I will you say, tell people dinosaurs are in the Bible. I don't know if you do that, but you should tell them because it's like, man, look, yeah. even if you believe the Bible, like, come on, if you're doing the flat earth stuff, you can't throw away dinosaurs, please. <laughs> Not to mention the, you know, thousands of fossils we have of dinosaurs that, yeah, are found by like conspiracy. Don't you know? No. That's conspiracy. Okay. Well, go to Montana and bring a shovel and tell me if it's a conspiracy. Um, but anyways, uh, I appreciate, you know, you taking the time to come on. We'll definitely do this again and continue to talk about Pachycetus, transitional fossils. Um, but other than that, thank you guys so much who have been watching. We still have 28 people watching. So you guys are troopers going through all this with us. Uh, make sure you, you know save the links that we have in the comments. They're great resources. Um, I can't wait to do this again. And we'll see you guys next time on Truth Over Tea.